India is undertaking a robust mission to the moon Chandrayaan-3. So far, Chandrayaan-3 has gone off very well. Not many people know that alongside the Indian Space Research Organization, there are many other institutions which have contributed. Among them is the Aerospace Engineering Department of the Indian Institute of Science, Bengaluru. I have with me Professor Radha Khan Padi. He is a professor at the Aerospace Engineering Department and somebody who has been involved both with Chandrayaan 2 and also with Chandrayaan 3. Uh, Dr. Padi, thanks a lot for speaking to it. Namaskar. Uh, Dr. Padi, uh, Chandrayaan 3, you have been involved in uh, the project in a very big way. Uh, how happy are you with the hardware and software of Chandrayaan 3? Well, Chandrayaan 3 is very good. I mean, there are a lot of improvements have been done from Chandrayaan 2 to Chandrayaan 3. Personally, I'm very, very happy. So there is absolutely no doubt that it is going to land safely. And almost uh, I can say with confidence that it will also land at the primary designated landing site. So that is the confidence that we all have. And thanks to ISRO for doing out, carrying out all the necessary activities for over the last three, four years. And don't forget that it was also a pandemic time. So despite all the difficulties, ISRO has head, heads up to them. Lot of dedicated scientists have put a lot of good effort. And we are always there anyway, but then uh, the, most of the credit goes to them. Certainly. The Indian Space Research Organization is the lead. Uh, academic institutions like the Indian Institute of Science have contributed. Uh, I believe lots of changes have taken place between Chandrayaan 3 and Chandrayaan 2. Can you tell me a little bit about that? And how does it make uh, Chandrayaan 3, especially the Vikram lander, more robust? Uh, very nice that you asked that. Uh, first thing to understand this, we should understand what happened in Chandrayaan 2. Uh, well, a lot, uh, lot of talks have been there in open domain now. To, a lot of people know about it. But to just summarize, uh, Chandrayaan 2 was actually a kind of a, a very critical mission in some sense, uh, in the sense that a lot of margins were not available. So a lot of uh, soul searching has been done after that. And then uh, the, a lot of improvements have been carried out. One reason that went bad in Chandrayaan 2 mission is all uh, because the thrust performance of the main engine was a little bit more than what is expected. And uh, just a little bit more is not that much of a difficulty or problem, but the reason is uh, it is actually operated for a long duration of time. When it operates in a long duration of time, then integral effect, the so-called integral effect kicks in. The eventually you are continuously breaking little more, little more, little more for a long time, and then the speed becomes lesser. So this actually leads to a lot of other issues, basically. So essentially, the, the uh, spacecraft thinks that I have to gain speed. So I have to go there, but velocity is less and all that. So they have to now add velocity. So instead of thrust vector being like this, which is opposite to the velocity, now it has to be like this to add velocity. So that actually demands some sort of a rotation change and all sort of things, basically. So this all sort of, sort of I mean, kind of uh, debate went on. So it tumbled. It not really tumbled, because a yeah, one-time tumble, and to the best of my knowledge. So what happened is, suppose you have got the thrust direction like that. The reason is, remember, the, all these vehicles are strapped down engine. That means uh, your uh, head is not really turning. So if you have to really turn, then entire body has to turn that way. So essentially, when the thrust is like this and you like you demand like that, it was not instantaneously met. So you require some time to meet. And there was some error in that also. Some software constraints and other things were there. So it was not actually going fast enough. Okay. So when it goes, tries to go, but not fast enough, but then actually it recomputes again. Then this direction is not same. It again requires like that. So initially it was like that, down like that, down like that, down like that, like that. It depends. So essentially it, it went to a full circle. So one time it tumbled. Chetu. Now, they also say there was a failure of the algorithm. Now, what is a failure of the algorithm for a layperson? Uh, well, uh, there is a lot to, in, a lot to in that sense. See, what I have been proposing for a very long time, including Chandrayaan 2 also, is there is something like a thrust continuity. Why this thrust continuity? Thrust means thrust, thrust magnitude and thrust direction continuity, both. Okay. 
And remember, thrust by mass is the acceleration. So this acceleration all in xyz direction is to be continuous. In other words, wherever you stop, if it's a phase one, your phase two should start from there. You should not demand something very different, basically. So that was uh, not there in the Chandrayaan 2 algorithm. So that has to be improved, and that way has been improved, actually. The penalty for that is you need a little bit of more fuel. And remember, now Chandrayaan 3 doesn't need an orbiter. It has got just a propulsion module. So that has given a lot of advantages, including this one. Sure. So Chandrayaan 3 now has a little bit of fuel, extra fuel, so you can afford to do this. Chandrayaan 3 has a little bit of better legs, so you can afford to kind of uh, go there with a little bit of extra velocity. Earlier, I think it was 2 meter per second within that. Now it is 3 meter per second. Uh, so then it's essentially you can talk about uh, little more payload, that whatever. So the, all these mass advantage was actually uh, very nicely utilized by ISRO because we have the Chandrayaan 2 orbiter. So data communication is not a problem still, and it's not a long duration mission, it's just about a month mission. So taking advantage of that, is, so I think it's a very smart move. So, so do you think Chandrayaan 2, especially the Vikram lander, was an under-tested machine because simulation tests were not enough, which is why we encountered a problem and the Vikram lander crash landed uh, well before its landing site? Well, in a critical mission like that, we never call that is under-tested. We normally test it in a very big way. I, I think uh, ISRO scientists also did it well. But also remember, this was the first mission. So they were inspired from a lot of other successful missions and things like that. And remember, the uh, moon doesn't have atmosphere, so it doesn't give too much of uh, surprises, right. wind effect and all that. So drag is still okay as long as you can predict. But when there's wind and all that, there's an unpredictability kicks in, basically. So those kind of things being not there. And a lot of prior moon missions are already there, so they were a little bit overconfident, I will say that way. So they told, okay, nothing will go wrong, basically, right? Even if little bit here and there goes wrong, we are ready for that. So that was the approach. And now it is a kind of a completely reverse. Now the design philosophy is, uh, as far as I understand, it is completely, everything will go wrong. So if everything goes wrong, you better be prepared for that, basically, right? So the, the captureability ball, we call in guidance, is much, much higher now. So that means even if the error bound, error from first phase is little higher, you're still able to guide it, basically. Meaning, it was designed for success and not designed for failure, and the testing was done for success and not tested enough for failure or the off nominal condition, is that correct? Not really. The off nominal conditions were tested, but not really for a larger ball. So you remember what we call capturability is the size of the ball. It's kind of a relay racing or like uh, you imagine a kind of a game where you and me and other people are standing in a row. You are not really running, you are just throwing the ball. So you are ready, uh, you are there ready to capture the ball. You capture it and throw it somewhere else, right? You will be able to capture provided my, my throw is more accurate so that your little, little bit radius ball it should fall actually, right? Your hands are not really very big. Okay. So now that, uh, that has been made bigger. So your hands are now bigger. And also remember, because of the thrust continuity comes with attitude continuity. That means your vehicle that uh, this attitude to this attitude, that demand itself will not come. So if the, uh, even if it comes, ISRO is ready for that. But the, by design, it is not coming, basically. So that's another rem remarkable improvement. Now, w there were many tests and simulations which have been done in hundreds in Chandrayaan-3. Uh, tell me a little bit about the testing, the, the hot test, the cold test, the helicopter test, and the, and the various tests using the cranes, and also uh, different tests which have been done for the legs. I, okay, again, this question is very well answered and better answered by ISRO scientists, but to the best of my knowledge, I will tell that. So essentially, remember, the last segment was a little bit uh, confident mission. That means there are too much of uh, kind of ambiguity or too much of uh, doubt was not there. So that is, this mindset was not triggered towards that, basically. And also, maybe there was a little bit of hurry, that part I don't know, basically. But the test was done. It's not that it's not done, but test was not done to what is called sigma bounds, basically. So you can normally call expected deviation normally falls within plus or minus three sigma. So now this three sigma it depends on how what is the value of the sigma. Okay. So the sigma bound itself was actually not considered very large. Now here we not only designed for three sigma bound, it is only three. It is actually designed for six sigma bound to some. Six sigma. Right. Sometimes it is designed for six sigma bounds, basically. So even if it is that much of a large deviation happens, still it is there and if the guidance tells us that it will not demand anything like a discontinuous attitude and all that. Thrust will be throughout continuous. That's a remarkable change in the guidance. Actually, that is the contribution which has come from our lab also. Now, also, is there a possibility if, if everything goes wrong, last time Vikram lander crashed 
and with it crash the dreams of one over one billion people. This time, is there a salvage mode by which if everything is still going wrong, it will still land? There are a couple of things. Uh, so again, first thing first is they have multiple uh, landing sites now. So and uh, even if it selects a site two, not site one, that is considered 100% success because uh, essentially that's also a valid site. So that is not going to be failure mode. Now, even if you are telling that uh, landing two is not available and things are going wrong and the, your sensors figure it out and all that, on board there is a salvage guidance, as you rightly saw. And the salvage guidance actually completely frees the landing site. It just talks about velocity reduction, actually altitude reduction and velocity reduction. So where it falls, well, if the God is with us, then it will fall in a pro proper place. If God is not with us, then it will fall on something which get the spacecraft may likely to tumble, likely to stay. We don't know, basically. Uh, so this is the extra thing that has been taken into account. In fact, that has also been rigorously tested, where it will excite. Where, so there, there is also a possibility of uh, wrongly exciting, that uh, whenever you have a salvage guide in something like that as a backup option, there is always this concern of uh, whether uh, the actual good mission will become bad, because it may get triggered that. Okay, so, that so that also has been debated well, and that has been sufficient care has been taken for that. Now coming to your other question, that uh, test mode and all that, I am so happy to see that uh, there is this cold test and hot test and all sorts of things that you talk about. So cold test is typically done without engine firing. So you just take the spacecraft to a certain altitude and you just drop it or something like that. And then you talk about dropping in a various, various terrains. Like terrain is not like a helipad or something, right? Terrains are whatever terrain is there. So you can actually drop, the spacecraft can actually drop in a little bit inclined terrain. That will still be okay. And uh, things like that. There are many, many tests that have been done. And of course, when it uh, spacecraft goes to the final segment, that has actually been dropped from a crane also. So to, to, to take that one side and drop it. But also remember, the, mimicking the actual lunar condition or moon condition is certainly not possible here. Because first thing is gravity change. You can talk about one-sixth of the gravity. You do not have uh, atmosphere there. So atmosphere effects are suddenly gone. The, some, some people argue that, okay, why can't you just do a kind of a actual mission and then land it there? Then the question is like in a aerospace theory, something called vacuum thrust and something called within atmosphere thrust. So whatever thrust you are producing within atmosphere is completely different from vacuum thrust. So vacuum, we cannot do it. I mean, vacuum conditions, you cannot do it uh, on Earth, basically. So this is the reasons why certain conditions cannot be done, certain, sorry, certain tests cannot be done. But whatever test is possible, it has all been done. So, so, so would you say, the the final when it comes into land about 800 meters above the surface of the moon there will be no vertical no horizontal velocity and then it'll simply come down to land as as on the gravity of the moon is that the way not really okay so because there is a gravity gravity is uh, the gravity is always going to pull you down so even though it is coming slowly, but still you have a thrust there. So thrust is going to kind of keep it balanced. So you release the little bit of thrust to make it slowly land. That, that's the whole idea there. But 800 meters is too far off. So essentially there is also something called retargeting. Retargeting means at some for some level where when you are very close to Earth, you can actually open up some high definition cameras and then there is a good algorithm. So remember 3D image becomes 2D. But still you can figure it out based on the uh, this uh, uh, sunlight. Shadows. Shadows, sorry, shadows. So depending on the shadows, you can figure it out and all that. And essentially what happens is if you don't see that uh, there is no problem there, nothing, no problem is there, you continue to land. If there is a problem, you have to uh, kind of go there and land. And that if is you see a hazard, if you see hazard, hazard detection. Hazard actually. If you see hazard, but even that hazard detection and hazard avoidance, you should not go at the zero height. You still do it at, uh, let's say, a little bit height of 10 meters and things like that. And from there, you go completely vertical. So it's very safe mission I mean, in that, that sense. So would you say that all the known unknowns have been taken care of uh, by the Indian Space Research Organization under uh, Mr. S. Somanath? Oh, I'm very confident about that. Uh, so essentially, I've, I've been a little fortunate to get involved in Chandrayaan 2 and 3 and also part of the mission review committees and things like that. So I'm very confident that everything everything known has been taken into account. So every, everything unknown, by definition, they are unknown. So we cannot talk about everything unknown. But to the best extent possible, the Six Sigma bound test has been done. And a lot of uh, testing, uh, hardware testing has been done. Uh, and also, I forgot to mention, uh, there are two onboard computers this time. 
compared to Chandrayaan 2, now it has two onboard computers. That means even if there is some computation or data processing problem or sensor problem, the second data is still available. So there are a lot of backup options like that. So I'm very confident that the mission is going to be highly successful. So lessons have been learned and implemented in Chandrayaan 3 from Chandrayaan 2. It was a hard landing for India in Chandrayaan 2. Yeah, certainly. I mean, we are very happy about that. And personally, I am very happy that one of our guidance algorithm is actually implemented for software lending and soft lending for the fine, fine breaking onwards. It just so happened that we actually had intensive collaboration with ISRO, and this is actually developed jointly between IAC and ISRO. So in that sense, I think academic uh, institutes like us has also played a huge role in this. So you're confident that this time India would be able to soft land on a celestial body unless unknown unknowns come into the play? Certainly. That's certainly very much rightly said. And of course, uh, there is hardly any chance. I can say that the chance of failure may be less than 0.1% actually. So 99.9% 99 .9 chance is going to be very high, the way it is expected. So that was Professor Radha Khan Padi, very confident that Chandrayaan 3 and the Vikram lander would have, would taste success and that India would be able to do a successful soft landing near the south pole of the moon. India is waiting with a bated breath for the success of Chandrayaan 3 mission. Once the landing happens, the ramp opens, and the Pragyan rover comes out onto the lunar surface. And that is where, for people like me, the first magic appears. Images would be taken by the Pragyan rover of the Vikram lander, and the Vikram lander would take images of the Pragyan rover. The first selfies from the lunar surface will come if Vikram has a soft landing on the moon. This is Pallav Bagla in New Delhi.